say with a, a bit of a confession, which is that uh, the time I had uh, which is that I'm going to be doing something that philosophers, as you know, are supposed to do, that is follow the argument where it leads, but I don't like where it leads, and so I'm following this argument where I don't want it to go. Uh, so, uh, so I'm, I'm actually going to be giving arguments in support of uh, conclusions uh, to which I'm intuitively averse. Uh, with that said, uh, I'll start by saying that uh, many people, uh, I think, now recognize that there are powerful moral objections to uh, factory farming and to eating animals that were uh, raised in factory farms, and that's primarily because of the uh, great suffering that the animals are caused throughout their entire lives in the factory farm setting. There's a chair here. There's one over here too. That might be a better spot over there. No, no. There's a, there's a chair there, and there's actually another chair here. And there's one in the back also. But there are many people who think that vegetarianism or veganism aren't the only permissible alternatives to eating animals from factory farms. There are increasingly many people who believe that uh, it's also permissible uh, to eat animals um, that have been humanely raised and killed uh, as painlessly and with as little fear as possible. And I'm going to call this practice of eating only such animals humane omnivorism because the animals are treated humanely and uh, the people who eat them are omnivores. Now I think it's really obvious that this practice is vastly better than eating meat from animals who are raised in factory farms, but the question still remains whether it's permissible. And some of the people who think that this practice is, is a permissible alternative to vegetarianism or veganism actually think not just that it is a permissible alternative, but that it's actually a superior alternative. And I'll uh, explain a little bit how, why some people might think that. But I find that, at least initially, a rather puzzling claim, and that's because this practice that I've described does involve killing. And it involves killing animals very early in the course of their natural lifespan. Most animals uh, that are killed even after being humanely reared in this way, are killed uh, about one-tenth of the way through their natural lifespan because it's economically pointless to keep them alive and continue to feed them and provide space for them and so on after they've achieved their size. So they're, they're caused to die very prematurely even if they are not uh, uh, caused to suffer while they're alive and even if they are actually killed in a way that causes very little pain or fear. Now, my, my sense is, from having talked to people and looked around a little bit, is that most people who think that this practice is permissible do so because they believe that while animal suffering matters, the lives of animals don't matter. So that causing animals to suffer is really objectionable, but causing animals to die or cease to exist is <coughs> not objectionable. And you see that in uh, a lot of other practices, for example, the way in which animal experimentation is now regulated uh, in laboratories. Uh, the regulations are concerned to ensure that the animals are not caused suffering that's disproportionate to the importance of the anticipated results of the experimentation. But once the experiment is completed, there's no expectation that experimenters should keep the animals alive and take care of them. They are, they are killed painlessly and, and, and tossed out. And that's not regarded as, am I mistaken about that? Okay, I just, I think that's true, that, that, that the, the animals are, are, are just killed and that's not against the regulations, that's entirely uh, considered permissible. But I think that if there's a moral objection to causing animals to suffer, there must also be a moral objection to depriving them of positive well-being that they might otherwise have. And 
The, the reason for that is pretty simple. Um, just as animals have an interest in not suffering, so they also have an interest in having positive well-being or pleasure or happiness or whatever. And I don't think there's any reason to suppose that their interest in avoiding suffering constrains our behavior morally, but their interest in having happiness or well-being doesn't constrain our behavior morally. Uh, a lot of us think that there is some kind of moral asymmetry between happiness on the one hand and suffering on the other. We believe, for example, that our reason not to cause suffering is, in general, stronger than our reason to promote people's happiness. But this, and so, so we have this asymmetry even in the way we think about our relations to other persons, and not just to animals. But uh, this view, this asymmetry does not extend, in the case of our dealings with other persons, to depriving people of happiness by killing them. We think that's bad and wrong. And there seems, I think there's a chair around, around to the back there. There's a chair. We think, of, we think of killing as a harm, but uh, it doesn't actually cause the victim anything intrinsically bad. It actually just prevents people from having further benefits. That's what, what killing does, but we think that's, that's really bad. And so there's no reason to think that our belief about the badness of killing for persons doesn't extend to include animals as well. Okay. Aha. About to be confused that my, my lecture text printed double sided and I was thinking I'm not supposed to be at that point. <laughs> okay. Uh, right, so the practice of humane omnivorism does involve killing animals prematurely. I think therefore it requires some kind of moral justification. And although it has remained in coit. There has been one argument in circulation for quite a long time. Uh, you'll find it in Peter Singer's book, uh, Practical Ethics, and he attributes it to Sir Leslie Stephen in the late 19th century. It's actually an earlier version of the argument that I found recently when I was reading the Boswell's Life of Johnson. Bos uh, Johnson gives a version of this argument just in conversation at a tavern with Boswell and a couple of other people. Um, Johnson's argument is specifically uh, concerned with causing animals to suffer, not with killing animals, so I'm not going to discuss uh, the issues raised by Johnson's argument, uh, though they are interesting and, and, and rather different, surprisingly. But here's what uh, Peter Singer quotes Leslie Stephen as saying. Stephen says, the pig has a stronger interest than anyone in the demand for bacon. If all the world were Jewish, there would be no pigs at all. That's the end of the quotation and the end of the argument. Um, but Peter Singer gives an interpretation of the argument in Practical Ethics. And here's what Peter says. I'm quoting now. Stephen's argument is that although meat eaters are responsible for the death of the animal they eat, they are also responsible for the creation of more animals, since if no one ate meat, there would be no more animals bred for fattening. The loss meat eaters inflict on one animal is thus balanced by the benefit they confer on the next. We may call this the replaceability argument. I think this isn't at all the best way to interpret Leslie Stevens' point. There's nothing in Singer's replacement argument as stated that would suggest that it has to be confined to animals. Uh, and yet no one supposes that it could be the case that uh, killing one person could be completely balanced by causing the existence of some new person whose life would contain as much good as the person who's been killed has lost. So no, nobody thinks that's a morally acceptable form of replacement, and I don't see any reason for thinking that uh, animals are any different. Uh, except in one possible case, I'll just mention, I do actually think the replaceability argument um, is plausible in its application to animals, if there are any such, and I suppose there probably are, that live entirely in the present moment. Um, that is, uh, animals that have no psychological connections to themselves in the, even in the future or in the past, so that their, their consciousness is 
uh, entirely confined to the present. I think in that kind of case, the objection to killing an animal of that sort really is impersonal in character. And it's only if the objections to killing are wholly impersonal in character that the replaceability argument, as Singer states, that has any force in my view. But I, so some animals are maybe like that, but I think most animals are not like that. They do have psychological relations to themselves in the past and in the future. And in the case of those animals, I think the replaceability argument uh, is in, inapplicable. But I think there's a better way of interpreting Stephen's point. I call it the benefit argument. So I'm going to sketch this idea for you. It doesn't take the, the form of you know, tightly constructed premises and a conclusion. It's more a gestural sort of argument. But I'll, I'll just give you some of the uh, assumptions on which uh, this argument is based. Uh, that is, the assumptions that would need to be true both empirically and uh, uh, morally for, for the argument to have any purchase. First assumption is that the animals that would be caused to exist in the course of a practice of humane omnivorism would actually have lives that are better than the lives of most animals in the wild. That is, these animals would be uh, uh, sheltered, fed, pr protected from predators, even perhaps provided with medical care when they need it, and, and, and so on. So they wouldn't live in fear, they wouldn't be torn apart by predators, and uh, you know, their lives would be comfortable. Uh, background to that is that the lives of many, if not most, animals in the wild are, are, are not terribly pleasant. But the lives of these animals could have if they were raised humanely and protected and so on. Could be. Second assumption, and this is a, this is a, a philosophical assumption, and that is that it is good for animals to be caused to exist and given lives that are worth living. Uh, and I think it's plausible to say that animals and persons benefit from being caused to exist and given lives that are <coughs> worth living. Now, those of you who work in population ethics may find that an unusual or controversial claim to make. Uh, I'm not here claiming, and nothing in the paper hinges on the claim that we have a moral reason to benefit animals or people by causing them to exist. It's just to claim that to be caused to exist with a life that's worth living, it is good for the individual who gets that life, and it can be described as a benefit. If you, again, if you think that's really controversial, consider the negative side of the, uh, of the matter. If we cause an individual to exist whose life is, consists not of nothing but continuous agonizing suffering, it seems clear that to do that is bad for that individual whom we've caused to exist. There's something bad happening, we've caused it, and there's no doubt about who the victim of the, the, the intrinsically bad suffering is. And so I think that if we cause an individual to exist with that kind of life in which the contents of the life are uniformly intrinsically bad. We've done something that's bad for that individual and I think it's perfectly permissible to say that we have harmed that individual. Now, I don't think we've done anything that's worse for that individual. This is the kind of case in which the rele relevant evaluative terms have to be uh, non-comparative rather than comparative. So I'm not making the claim that it's better for an animal to be caused to exist and not to be, or that it's worse for an individual whose life is not worth living to be caused to exist and not to be caused to exist. So I'm asserting only the non-comparative claims. It can be good to be caused to exist, or it can be bad to be caused to exist, and bad for the individual who's caused to exist. Third assumption, again a moral assumption, is that we have no moral duty to bring animals into existence and give them lives that are worth living. We may have some moral reason, but I'm just going to assume that whatever that reason is, it doesn't rise to the level of a duty. And I'm going to assume here's an empirical claim that the animals we might cause to exist through the practice of humane omnivorism would not be caused to exist unless we had the expectation of being able to kill them and eat them. That is, we would bring these animals into existence only to satisfy this interest that we have. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist at all. So what that means is that if 
their lives would be beneficial to them, if their lives would be a benefit, they can have this benefit only on condition of having a premature death. That's the idea. So my conclusion is that overall, the practice of humane omnivorism is good for all the animals who are caused to exist and then are killed for human consumption. We can assume that the practice would also be good for the people who get to eat the animals because they, they want to do that. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the ecological consequences of our continuing to eat meat even through a practice of humane rearing in this paper. We can talk about that in the discussion if you want. It may well be that there's an environmental argument against humane omnivorism that appeals to our own interest that's just decisive, you know, that contributes sufficiently to global warming or something like that. But I'm, I'm more interested in this paper in the sort of deeper moral issues. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, even though once the animal exists, it would be worse for it to be killed than to be allowed or enabled to go on having a life that's worth living. Overall, the practice of humane omnivorism is good for the animal because the animal would not ever exist and have the benefits of life in the first place and would not be in a position to be either killed or enabled to continue to exist if we didn't have the practice in the first place. And the claim of the benefit argument, the fundamental claim of the argument just is that the killing, the act of killing, is somehow morally offset by the fact that the practice overall is good for every animal that is harmed by being killed. It's on balance good for all the animals and on balance good for people as well. So that's a sketch of the argument. You notice that makes no reference to replacement or replaceability. It could apply in a one-off case. Now, I might decide to just bring one animal into existence, uh, give it a good life, cause it to, you know, and then, and then but painlessly the benefit argument would apply in that case. Um, this argument is also um, incompatible with the consideration that I think actually motivates most people who become humane omnivorous, namely the idea that animal life doesn't matter. Animal suffering does, but animal life doesn't. Very foundational premise of the benefit argument is that it is good for animals to exist and good for them to continue to exist as long as their lives are worth living. And that's, that's either incompatible with or in tension with the view that animal life just doesn't matter. And it's not beneficial to animals to continue to live once they already exist. Now, uh, there's an initial really obvious objection to this argument that I've given, and that is that the very same argument can be applied in the case of persons. It might well be that we could, that we might, we might create new people, for example, only on condition that we would be able to kill them at some point in adulthood and use their organs for transplantation to save the lives of, uh, of, of a greater number of others. And I don't know anybody who thinks that that would be permissible. So we've got this uh, objection in the case of persons. Does that work in the case of animals? Well, uh, you might think that the reasons not to kill persons are different from the reasons not to kill animals. Different in kind and perhaps stronger. You might think, for example, that killing a person uh, violates the person's rights, whereas animals have interests but perhaps not rights. And so it may well be that we are constrained from uh, the parallel practice involving persons constrained from pursuing that practice by the fact that once people exist, they have rights, but we're not similarly constrained in the case of animals if animals don't have rights. Uh, in some ways, that's a, 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 a dangerous move for the defender, uh, or the, the, 
the, the um, uh, uh, defender of the benefit argument to make because it raises the question that you'll find raised repeatedly throughout the literature on animal ethics uh, of what exactly the difference might be morally between conscious, sentient, intelligent animals and human non-persons whose uh, psychological capacities and potentials may be no higher than those of the animals. So if you think, for example, that the reason that the benefit argument is blocked in, the, in its application to persons but does apply in the case of animals is that persons have rights and animals don't. I've been using the word persons here deliberately rather than human beings um, because it's arguable at any rate that what gives persons rights are attributes and capacities that only human beings with a certain level of psychological capacity have. You might think, for example, that fetuses don't have the same rights that adults have, and that would be because they are non-persons in this Lockean sense. And so if you make the claim about animals, um, then you have to ask, would a version of the benefit argument work in its application to fetuses, newborn infants, and other human non-persons? I'm not going to discuss that here, but that's that's one of the perils of appealing to rights uh, as, as a means of blocking the application of the argument to persons, but allowing it to apply to the case of animals. So let's assume for the moment that animals don't have rights. I'll come back to that assumption. Even if they don't have rights, they do have interests. And it does seem that our action is constrained morally by a requirement to respect the interests of animals, perhaps in some kind of utilitarian or consequentialist way. Um, so at least when, 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 we're, when we're thinking about the permissibility of killing an animal, we should, we should be required to think about the interest that the animal has at the time. Does, does that uh, help us to deal with the benefit argument? Here's the way you, you might reason about this. When it comes time to kill the animal, we, we need to think about how the animal's interest in continuing to live um, and continuing to have a life that's worth living weigh against whatever interest would be served by our killing. And here's how I think that comparison might go. So imagine we've got a, a pig. And I'm just making this up because I have no idea what the number is. But let's imagine that this one pig, if painlessly killed, could provide the meat part of a meal for each of 100 people. And it would carve this one pig up, and it would provide a bit of meat, the meat component of a complete meal for 100 people. So the interests that would be served by killing the pig are the interest of each of these 100 people in the difference in pleasure they would get between a meal with the, the bit of meat with it and the pleasure they would get from a meal without that meat but with some non-meat substitute. So it's the difference in pleasure that these 100 people would get. That's the, that's the interest that each one of them has. And we think about the pig. Well, the pig, remember, it's being killed about one-tenth of the way through its life. Most pigs are killed within the first year of life. They could live about 14 years. Um, so they're being deprived of, let's suppose, 13 years of good life with all the meals that they would eat during that period, all the pleasure that they would get from eating their food. Those of you who have dogs or cats or whatever know that animals do uh, get pleasure from, uh, from eating. And then there are all the other pleasures that the pig would have as well. So if we compare you know, the interest of the pig in having all the pleasures over 13 years of life with the, the small pleasure or difference in pleasure that the people would get between the, 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 the two possible meals, um, it looks like the pig's interest just went hands down overwhelmingly. And I'm going to call this uh, the argument from interests. This, this is the argument from interests against the benefit argument. And I used to like this argument, um, but now I think there are really powerful objections to it. So what I'm going to do is to give you the objections to the counter argument that I just stated, the, the interest argument. Okay, the first response to this argument from interest is this. Suppose that 
these humane farmers have caused uh, a number of animals to exist and reared them humanely and given them lungs that are worth living. And now it's time, they've reached full size, so now it's time to kill them uh, painlessly. You might have been thinking all along, there's nothing that actually compels the farmers at this point to do the killing. Here are these animals, they've been caused to exist for this purpose, but there's nothing constraining these farmers to, saying that they actually have to kill these animals. One of the options is you don't kill them. And suppose we say to the farmers, uh, the interest that these animals have in going on living vastly outweigh the interest that will be served by killing them. That's a reason not to kill them. Uh, so we as philosophers going to tell the farmers that. And, uh, we can imagine the farmers then replying, OK, um, what are we supposed to do with them now? Uh, and the farmers can plausibly say to us, all we've done for these animals is we've done nothing but good for them. We've caused them to exist, we've fed them, sheltered them, protected them, and so on. So we've just been uh, conferring benefit after benefit on these animals. Is that alone a reason why we are morally required to keep them alive indefinitely and pr continue to feed them, shelter them, protect them, and so on? I think not. I, I don't think it's plausible to suppose that, the, that these farmers would be morally required to keep these animals alive and help them continue for the rest of their natural lives at, at, at their own expense and with no expectation of any kind of uh, reciprocity or compensation for this. Um, you may be thinking, what about people's children? Um, I'll just anticipate that very briefly to come back to it in the discussion. That's different. The parent-child relation is a very special uh, kind of relation that comes with responsibilities and duties that don't attend the causing of an animal to exist. Uh, so I'm going to assume that the farmers don't have a duty to continue to provide these benefits for the animals. They may think, we've provided these benefits for these individuals for this long, we're going to stop providing the benefits now. That seems to me a reasonable thing for them to, to say. Uh, so now they repeat the question, what are we going to do? Should we turn them loose, for example? And I think we would have to say to that, no, that would be a bad idea. That would be bad for people, and it would probably be bad for the animals as well, because they are domesticated types of animal. Um, we turn them loose, they just go run out in the roads and get hit by cars or killed by predators or starve to death or die of disease slowly or something like that. So suppose that's right. Then, then the next thing the farmers can say to us is, well, in that case, um, looks like it's permissible for us to practice euthanasia on these animals since we don't have to take care of them. We can't turn them morally. We can't turn them loose. So what we need to do is kill them painlessly. And that, I don't, I don't have anything to say to that, but of course that's what they're getting ready to do in the first place. <laughs> Uh, so we've got absolutely nowhere here uh, in practical terms if the assumptions I've made are correct. So of course they can say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll euthanize them, but after we've euthanized them, can we please sell the meat? And so the farm's already been done then. Okay, so that's one, one response to what I'm calling the interest argument. Here's another more philosophical uh, response to that argument that I think is uh, more important. And that is that my earlier claim about uh, the pig's interests outweighing the interests of the people presupposes a measure of the misfortune that an individual suffers in dying or being killed uh, according to which the misfortune is just proportional to the amount of good life that the individual loses by dying or being killed. And this is a, a common sort of view that follows from a standard understanding of the deprivation of account, the deprivation of account and the badness of death that you'll find in a lot of the literature. The problem with this understanding of how we should measure the misfortune of death, though, is that although it yields plausible implications in the case of older children and adults. It's highly implausible in my view in any case that when it's applied to very early death. So for example, it implies that the very worst death that an individual can suffer is that which occurs immediately after the individual begins to exist. So 
I don't know what you, you, you probably have different beliefs about when we begin to exist, but on any plausible view, we begin to exist prior to the birth. And so you can, on this view, you're going to have to believe that the death of a fetus is a much greater misfortune than the death of a 20-year-old or an undergraduate or whatever. And that seems to be very implausible. And it's something that people don't believe. Uh, you can look at people's reactions to statistics about spontaneous abortion and miscarriage. You can look at the resources that societies devote to the prevention of miscarriage and spontaneous abortion and so So it just seems to me to be false that the worst death that an individual can possibly suffer is that which occurs immediately after the individual begins to exist. Those deaths don't seem particularly bad at all. My view is there's, really nothing, there's no significant difference between an individual's beginning to exist and immediately dying and that individual's never coming into existence at all. I can't find any difference between those uh, evaluatively. So I, I think the solution to this, or the best solution, there's several solutions to, to this problem. I think the best solution is to understand the misfortune of death as uh, a function of two factors, one being the amount of good life that the individual loses in dying, and the other being the extent to which the individual at the time of death would have been psychologically connected to itself or himself or herself in the future at the times at which the good uh, states or experiences or events in the first life would have occurred. And this explains, for example, why uh, the death of a fetus is not tragic or bad for the fetus in the way that the death of a 20 year old is bad for the 20 year old. The fetus is psychologically just completely disconnected from itself in the further future when the good things in its life would occur. It, not self-conscious, can't think about the future, can't anticipate the future, has no desires or intentions for the future, in the future won't be able to remember its life as a fetus and so on. So, uh, and you'll recognize this as part of its view about um, what matters as a as what matters is psychological connectedness and continuity rather than identity. And that view I think explains, as I said, why the death of a fetus is, is a lesser misfortune. But it also implies that the death of a pig is a lesson of misfortune because pigs aren't closely psychologically connected with themselves in the further future. They don't anticipate what's going to happen to them a year from now. And they're going to have very few memories a year from now of what's going on now and so on. So the psychological connections within the life of the pig are very weak. And for that reason, we may, in, in assessing the strength of the pig's interest now in continuing to live, we should discount the uh, strength of the interest it has in the pleasures and good events that would occur uh, much later in its possible life. And if that's right, then uh, that's a reason for thinking that in the case I sketched a little while ago, uh, in which we were weighing up the interests of 100 people and having some meat for dinner against the interests of the pig, it no longer is quite so clear that the interests of the pig uh, outweigh those of the people. Okay, so those are some objections to uh, the interest argument, uh, or the argument for interest against the benefit argument. And there's another response to the uh, argument for interest, and that is that it's, it actually really just ignores what I'm calling the benefit argument, because it's focusing entirely on the act of killing and the interest that the uh, animal has in not being killed. But it's just not taking into account the claim of the benefit argument that somehow or other that killing, the act of killing, is morally offset by the fact that the animal gets the benefit of life only on condition that it can be killed at this later point. So it's not, the, 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 the argument from interest really isn't engaging quite directly with the uh, benefit <coughs> argument. I mentioned earlier that. Some people hope to block the application of the benefit argument to persons by appealing to the idea that persons have rights but animals don't, or these persons have a right not to be killed and animals don't have that right and they may have an interest in not being killed. One way, of course, of, of uh, trying to block the application of the benefit argument um, to the killing of animals 
is just to say, as many people do, that animals, in fact, do have rights, and they do have a right not to be killed, and that, they, that the, uh, our dealings with animals can't be conducted just on, on the basis of calculations of way their interests weigh against our interests. So let's suppose for a moment that animals do have rights, and that they have a right not to be killed, and the anticipation that the later killing of the animal would violate its rights blocks the permissibility of, of it doesn't block the permissibility of bringing the animal into existence, but it defeats any reason that we might have to bring the animal into existence. So that's that's going to uh, prevent us from having the practice of human members and that the animal has this, this right. That's one way of trying to show that the benefit argument doesn't support humane omnivorism. But although it doesn't, although it shows that um, <coughs> if we grant that, uh, that animals have rights, it, it shows that the benefit argument doesn't apply to, doesn't support humane omnivorism in the way that we practice it now. But it wouldn't do anything, I think, to um, uh, uh, count against an alternative possible practice of humane omnivorism, which uh, isn't, isn't scientifically possible now, but, but could be quite soon if we really set our minds to it. And that's this. You know, imagine that we could genetically modify certain animals so that they would inevitably just drop over dead painlessly uh, when they reached full size. So we wouldn't have to do any act of killing. These would be animals that would come into existence, healthy animals, have good lives, they wouldn't come into existence if we didn't genetically modify them and cause them to exist. But when they reached full size, whenever that is, after about a year or something like that, they would just painlessly drop over dead. There would be no act of killing. The pharmacy would just go out and Fields and, and collect the you know collect the bodies on the schedule, bring them in, and, um, and there, so there's your alternative practice of humane omnivorism. Now, what I want to claim here is that there would be, you know, in the in the original practice of humane omnivorism, as people do it today, there is one act uh, in the process that is worse for the animals, namely killing it. In this alternative version of humane omnivorism, there's never anything done to the animals that's bad for them or worse for them. Um, and I think, and I'll, I'll say something about this in a minute, doesn't violate their rights either. Um, it's not bad for them or worse for them because they wouldn't exist if we didn't have this practice of uh, genetically modifying animals and causing them to exist in order to be able to eat them. We might still bring animals into existence to, uh, to, to eat them later on, but they wouldn't be the same animals. That's not necessarily because these animals could not exist without their particular genetic constitution, so I'm not making that metaphysical claim. This is just another instance of the non-identity problem. If you're familiar with the it's non-identity problem, this is just an instance of it. If we raised animals in the ordinary way, a certain set of individual animals will come into existence. If we raise animals in a completely different way and genetically modify it, there's just no chance that any of the animals that would exist if we raised animals in the ordinary way would, would actually be among those we would bring into existence if we genetically modified them. So, so the claim is, can be, you could make the metaphysical claim, but I don't need it. It's just contingently true that the uh, animals that we might bring into existence is what would never exist if we didn't have this practice. Therefore, if they get these good lives um, with the practice, nothing is done to them that's bad or worse for them. Um, it's hard to see how that could be uh, a, a projectable relative to their never coming into existence at all. Now, some of you are thinking ahead and asking the question, well, can we do this with people as well? Why don't we genetically modify human beings so that they are pre-programmed infallibly uh, to drop over dead at the age of 30? Or we might, if we have really sophisticated genetic engineering uh, 
process processes. We could genetically engineer them to drop over dead painlessly. Whenever there 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 would be five people with the same tissue type who, whose lives they could be saved. You know, they had these sensors that would. What are you saying? It's about the goriness of that. <laughs> um, there's also the silliness factor that's emerging in that one. Um, but it's not, it, it's not gory. That's what, you know, that's what I meant when I, uh, when I said you're not going to get a lot of gruesome blood and guts in my examples. And they just cheerfully drop dead. <laughs> okay, well, we could do this with people. And again, I think nobody would think that that would be permissible. But, again, but notice, think about it in the case of people. We cause these people to exist. They're genetically modified. They would never exist at all if we um, uh, didn't genetically modify them to die young. They get a, a certain amount of good life, and then they painlessly drop over dead at some, at some point. But earlier than the rest of us drop over dead. Uh, I want to claim not bad for them. What we do in causing them to exist is not bad for them. It's not worse for them than never existing. That reminds me it doesn't even make sense. What's more, it doesn't, I think, violate their rights. I don't think anybody has a, a, a right to live a, a, some certain number of years. For example, if there were a couple, people who wanted to have their own natural child and their genes were such that any child they might cause to exist would inevitably die at the age of 30 or 35 or something like that, I don't think it would be impermissible for them to have that child. I don't think that uh, the child could claim that its rights were violated by being caused to exist with a predetermined uh, shorter lifespan than most other people have. There would be objections to it, to, to doing this, obviously. But one of the questions is, what are those objections? And do the objections apply also in the case of animals? Well, I mentioned a moment ago that this is an instance of a non-identity problem. And so it looks to me as if the solution to this problem, this is what makes it so vexing and, and difficult, but ultimately the resolution of the, this, the issue that I'm discussing here may depend on our ability to achieve some uh, resolution of the non-identity problem, some solution to the non-identity problem. Here's one possibility. You might think that even though causing these people to exist, so they're going to drop over dead early, uh, isn't bad for them, it's not worse for them, may not even violate their rights. Nevertheless, if we do this, we're going to be exploiting these people. It seems like there's an objection to this kind of exploitation. I, I don't myself know exactly what to think about appeals to exploitation. In a lot of cases, I find it really just impossible to think that the fact that some act or practice does involve objectionably exploiting people is therefore impermissible. I tend to think that there are cases in which exploitation should be or must be permissible. So let me give you a, let me just give you a quick example. I think I've got time to do this. Uh, imagine a company that manufactures some kind of thing, and they can set up a factory somewhere. They can set it up in a very poor region of the world and pay the people in that region of the world an exploitative wage. If they do that, that's going to actually be better for those people than if the company doesn't go there. Uh, no other company is going to go there. So if this company goes there, that's going to be all things considered better for these poor people than if the company doesn't go there. The company can set up its factory in its home territory or somewhere else, but if it goes anywhere else, it's going to have to pay the workers a fair wage. Um, and let's assume that the company doesn't have any duty to put its factory in the poor area rather than at home. It can do whichever it wants. It's more profitable for the company to put the factory in the poor area, but still profitable if it puts it in its home territory or in some other wealthy society where it will have to pay the workers 
fair wage. I can't, I, I, I can't believe that it is impermissible for the company to put the factory in the very poor area when that's actually going to be better for the people there um, and we might even suppose not worse for anybody else and better for the company. It is exploitative. It is objectionable for that reason. We might think, we might not think very well of the, com the corporate executives who make that choice that could pay these people a higher wage but then they wouldn't make the profit and there would be no reason to put the factory there than to put the factory in a wealthy country. Uh, you know, here are these poor people in this region, they really would like to have the factory because it's going to make them better off. And there's no other way that they're going to be better off if, if, if the company doesn't put the factory there. It just seems to me crazy to say you know, it's absolutely impermissible for the company to do what would be better for everybody concerned. Uh, so I'm not persuaded by appeals to exploitation. There's, of course, differences between that case and the case of causing animals to exist because in this case there's better and worse, in the animal case there's just good and, and, and not good. So there's comparative uh, claims to make about the exploitation case, but only non-comparative claims to be made about the uh, animal's case. I think that any plausible solution to the non-identity problem is going to have to be based on a comparison between the lives of individuals that are caused to exist and other individuals, different individuals, who might have been caused to exist instead. Uh, maybe the same is true about animals. Maybe it is, it's objectionable to bring animals into existence when it would be possible to bring better off animals into existence instead. On the other hand, in this particular kind of case, the case of humane omnivorism, the options aren't, the, the, the practical, feasible and permissible options aren't just cause some animals to exist who uh, have good lives but shorter lives and cause different animals to exist who would have good lives but longer lives. Um, that's not the, the, the second is not a relevant option in this kind of case because um, we don't have any reason to cause these any or particularly any moral reason to cause these animals to exist. Our reason for causing them to exist is self-interested. So it's not clear to me that, that the, what I think is going to be an inevitable part of any plausible solution to the non-identity problem is going to have any application in the case of humane omnivorism. Let me conclude uh, by giving you one more really quick argument in favor of humane omnivorism. And remember, as I said at the beginning, I don't, I, intuitively I don't like this idea of humane omnivorism. I, I wouldn't do it. I, you know, I, I would need an animal that had been raised this way. I don't, but I'm trying to figure out why. You know, why is it, are my intuitions defensible or are they not? So let me give you one other argument. As you probably all know, we can now grow a little slab of meat in a dish in a laboratory through manipulating stem cells and that kind of thing. So we can grow a little chunk of beef or something like that in a petri dish in the lab. Uh, I don't see anything objectionable about that at all. I can't find any moral objection to doing that, to growing a little slab of uh, animal muscle tissue and frying it up. And I wouldn't want it myself, but I don't, you know, if other people want it, that's okay. Then somebody might say, that's really inefficient. It's very costly to grow these little steaks all in separate petri dishes. I mean, there's, a, there's a more efficient way to do that, and that is um, you can grow all the meat together in one package. Um, and you can do that by having a whole animal minus either the brain or the head. You just suppress the action of the genes that code for the development of the brain or the head, so you just get big slabs of, of all sorts of meat wrapped around bone and, uh, and skin. Um, that's been possible for a very long time. I remember seeing more than 20 years ago, uh, studies about um, researchers, I don't know why they did this, I don't know what the point of this was, but you know, they, they brought headless mice to term. And so these, these these mice fetuses and newborn mice were born alive but headless. And of course they died when they were separated from the maternal life support system, but um, that wasn't, you know, so, you, so we know we can grow headless living animal organisms. We can do that again. Whether whether these animal organisms would be headless or just anencephalic doesn't seem to matter. I also can't find any objection to to that. So if people wanted to grow animal bodies without 
mines in uh, incubators and use them as sources of meat. I can't find any objection to that. Now suppose somebody says, look, you've got something here. It's, it, it, it's perfectly morally permissible. It's acceptable. Uh, um, and it's good for all these people. But it's also very expensive because it involves raising all these bodies in incubators. Uh, and the only beneficiaries are the people. I got a better proposal. Give these animals brains and turn them loose in the pasture, and they're self-sustaining. You don't have the expense of the incubators. And what's more, not only do the people benefit, but the animals benefit. So we add two nice new features to this permissible <laughs> practice. That is, we, we, we make it cheaper, and we add to the number of beneficiaries. Have we then made it impermissible um, by adding two good features to something that was already permissible? I'm not sure what to do with that argument either, but I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs>